I'll just start out, our, you talked about family and being in military and so forth. Well, I started out, our, our, my uncle was in the first, first World War. I had, I think, 15 cousins in the Second World War. One of them was lost in the Air Force bomber. Uh, another one wounded or so forth. But then I came along and uh, got drafted, got my orders there for Korea. Well, I started out basic training. We were at Fort Knox, Kentucky for basic. But we took armored basic, which was a combination of infantry and tank. So we got tank gunneries, what, whatever, driving, working on them, whatever. Just, but, uh, so af after that, about 12 weeks, well, I signed up for leadership class, which was an attempt to uh, dodge going to Korea, but it didn't work out. So um, <clears throat> after the leadership, why, we were, I was sent home for a few days and then went, uh, had a meet a troop train in Chicago, went out to San Francisco, and then it was early December, got on a, the General MiG, a troop ship with about 3,500 guys. <laughs> um, on our way to Korea, we got there about well, we stopped in Japan with, uh, we got uh, 15 days on the water. Then we got, went to Yokohama, Japan, and stayed there a couple days till Christmas. Then after Christmas, we went to Sasebo, Japan, on a train with some, a lot of French uh, troops. And then uh, the 2nd of January, we, that's when we went over from Sasebo to land in Pusan. So uh, now, I, I, we were just went as a replacement. I have no organization or no unit, just uh, so, well, we got off the boat and they just walked you right on a, truck, open truck, like a cattle car, and just keep walking till you couldn't walk no more, and then, then you stood in the truck, to, and they took us to a railroad station. From there, we went up to Seoul, and uh, we got off, and uh, we went in this, the, Army had some offices in a, in a building, which was still standing. But uh, they had the whole uh, first floor was all offices, and it was all sealed in. But they told us, "Well, we go up, just go upstairs. Your rooms are up there." Well, we went upstairs and. It's about 30 below zero, there's no windows or nothing, and pick a spot out on the floor. That, that was your, that's the rooms that they gave us that night. So from there, why well, we just called us all out and, you know, assigned us to a truck and went up, and you didn't know where you were going, what you were doing, and when we got, about 20 miles north of Seoul, uh, they, I saw this bunch of tanks parked over on a, in the side of a field, and they said, uh, you know, called my name, said, there's 73rd Tank Battalion, just get off and go, that was it. So I went up there, and uh, I just, they, they said, well, just, the tanks, though, your platoon, they're up on the line. And they said, just wait a couple days, they'll be coming back. So then you could get assigned to a tank. Well, a 
couple days later, they come rolling in, and um, that's when I got assigned to a tank, but uh, these guys weren't very happy. They had just spent 30 days uh, assigned to the 1st Rock Infantry Division. Of, and the 73rd was the only American troops with these Korean. Of course, there was a interpreter that was always on a radio, a Korean lieutenant. But um, so the thing was, those guys had just come back 30 days, and that means why you were up on a line with these Korean, all you ate was sea rations for 30 days. They didn't bring no food or nothing to you. No showers, no nothing, just 30 days being with these rock division. And uh, they, they were only back about two hours and they, they called them all out and well, I went with them, and they just said, well, get on the tank. He said, we got to go back up. The, the C Company, who was replacing, they didn't have enough tanks to cover up there. So, so they, we had to go back up again. It was my first turn. I didn't know. And that's when I got up there. Well, the, the 30 days was... No showers, no food, regular food, just sea rations. And we just hang out during the day and wait for the night. That's when all the activities went on. But tanks were very, you were so limited. I mean, there was, you can't go up those mountains where they were doing all the fighting, you know. Um, and you can't go in a rice paddy. They got, they're too soft. So um, we were just kind of, I guess, artillery more or less. But we kept moving and everywhere. We were always moving. So we, we, as far as any tent, tents or anywhere to live, well, I spent my time sleeping under a tank. I, that was my, my uh, bedtime. Little, a couple little guys could stay inside the tank. By the way, we, these were all M46 patent tanks. I don't know if anybody is interested in that or not, but uh, had a 90 millimeter gun on it, a 50 caliber on top, and two 30 calibers. One the assistant driver and one the uh, was coaxial with a big gun, uh, uh, and I started out about a couple of days. I was a loader then. Well, I was one of the few guys who had tank training. Over over there, we had cooks and we had infantry and you name it, and they were just. They'd come in when they needed something. If you didn't, they just, whatever your MOS was didn't matter. If they needed a tank driver, they, you were it, even if you were a cook or something. So it was on, on the job training a lot in, while we were there. So now this was all in 1952. I was there the whole, almost a whole year. Then. But it was, a great experience, <laughs> right, Bob? <laughs> yeah. Experience you didn't want to get involved with, but uh, no, it. I mean, we had all our e equipment and that we parkas and mittens and about three, four layers of clothes, and Arctic sleeping bags, and but uh, you you learn some tricks, you. Know dig out a slot in the snow and then pile the snow up on either side to keep the wind off of you and that would take your boots off and that's it. So that's, uh, and then later on in the summer, 
we went over with the 7th Infantry Division. They pulled the 9th Rock, or the 1st Rock Division out. And uh, that's when we were over around Chorwan and so forth. But, uh, that's that pretty well covers me. I mean, <laughs> With the sea rations, oh well, being in a tank, that that was, we just, you put the can up in the exhaust pipe and uh, just so you didn't heat it too much and blow it up, that was a, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. How's that your direction of rocks? Well, you, you can't speak the language and you know, and you get a lot of hand signals and so forth. It officially, I mean, they had this Lieutenant Lee, he was a, an interpreter who was always on the radio who could talk to the rocks and give us any information. But no, they, we didn't have no problems with them. They, they were kind of tough little guys, I tell you that. <laughs> And very young, uh, some of them. They, they look like 16 year old kids. How, how many people were in a tank and were you with the same people all the time? Yes, there's five people in a tank the driver, the assistant driver, the gunner, the loader, and I had that good position. Tank commander, was, so you stand up out of there and be a good target. That, that was me. <laughs> but I'm tall, but I could get short real quick. So I said, well, you have to. In firing at the back blast, you can't. Uh, this is kind of a stone age fire direction that we had. All, all I had was field glasses and then tell the gunner and then he would pick out the target or that I picked out if we picked out the same place. And uh, he'd fire, but I had to duck down for the back blast and then jump up with his field glasses and then try to see how far away it hit. So, but uh, it, you get used to it. Did you have any APCs? Yes. Yes, that 90 millimeter, that was high velocity. That, it was, uh, they copied it after the German 88, but those armor piercing, yeah. They, but we didn't have too many of uh, those shells. We had some, but. Now after the Korean War, did they, they came out with the M60 tank. That's yes, the, yes. They had one driver. Yes, yeah, they, yeah, they only have four. Well, but there's a lot of times over here, we only had four, which was a problem when you, you're talking about R&R. &R. If you didn't have uh, a five-man crew, nobody could go, because only one could go if you had four others to stay on the tank, so. Yeah. Did your tank ever blow a track? <laughs> no, that's that's another story that you, uh, we were up with the, uh, I think it was a 32nd regiment with the 7th Infantry, and a after the attack was over and, well, we didn't do, do nothing, but then we were back in a wooded area, and as my, the driver, he said, there's something wrong, you know. I says, well, let me go out and take a look. I went around the front, and, this, and I went around the front, some bullets zinged by me. Somebody was watching me. So I think he thought he got me, but I was around and up and in. But the track was just starting to come off, and I was able to direct him. The other tanks were leaving, so I didn't want to be out there by ourselves. That wasn't a good spot to be. 
but um, we it got it back on. And when we got back, we tightened those tracks up a little bit. So they always came loose, so you know. I mean, one of those tanks, 46 tons, is what it was. And talking about that, that was my tank when you signed out for it. They said you're signing out for, for $250,000. I, I need somebody to figure out making uh, $180 a month, how long that would have taken me to pay if I was if I had messed up with that tank, but so, and that's the other, those tanks, a lot of fuel now, you, you got two gallons to the mile is what you get, it had the two 800 height, 200 horsepower, two 800 horsepower Chrysler engines, two of them were in there. And they were gasoline engines. Everybody always thinks that tanks were uh, diesel, but diesel didn't work in that cold over there. These, you know, gasoline engines would work if you didn't have water in the fuel, which we run into that a few times. Well, I tried to follow instructions there. <laughs> you wear one pair and put the other inside of your jacket and try to keep them. Oh, yeah, there was a lot of them. Well, that's cold You're, you just never felt before. I mean, it, uh, I know I never, and I worked outside and that all my life so in construction. Yeah, they said the wind come out of Siberia, and uh, well, I mean, <laughs> but once it gets down below zero and they start that twenty and thirty, what difference does it make? I mean, you know, <clears throat> now everything freezes. Your beer freezes. Have a problem over there? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. You said you was a loader at first? Well, for, for about... How many in your platoon had hearing problems? Hearing problems? After they got out. Well, some of them did. I don't... I didn't have it myself. But uh, that's one thing we could... Anybody in tanks, you can go and get hearing aids from the VA because of being in armored like that. But... Uh, no, you never had no ear protection or nothing like that. They just, you just did what you had to do. That's After the recall, you got that ringing. Yes. I was so, with the 3rd and 68th and the 4th and 69th. Yeah. <laughs> Too loud. Uh -huh. Well, I guess that's... Uh, <laughs> There's other stories, but I know they don't want to hear all this. <laughs> so, but, um, no. okay.